The following podcast is a presentation of This is Infamous. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Just the Worst Wrestling Podcast. Episode number 27, to be perfectly precise. I'm your host, Billy Donnelly, who you can find at JoeBlow.com. This is Infamous, and right here at Just the Worst Podcast. And as the show title dictates, well, we talk wrestling, sports entertainment, whatever it is that you want to call it, that's what we discuss, that's what we break down, that's what we opine about week in and week out. And this week, well, that's no different, because otherwise... We'd have a completely different show on our hands. And as we head towards WrestleMania, having now suffered through a roadblock, you sort of lay out and see where things may be going. So uh, this week, once again, uh, decided to fly solo as we once again look at WWE Roadblock, the WWE Network Special that has now fallen in between Fastlane and WrestleMania and sort of given us a bit of a detour again of sorts as we head towards WrestleMania 32 in Dallas, Texas. And we'll also talk about some of the fallout uh, on Raw the next night. And I want to get into a couple of comments being made about NXT as well. Uh, and, and also going to talk about um, an, in- an injury that uh, the WWE suffered. Another injury that they've suffered. Um, to just add to the list. That um, I don't know necessarily hurts the company. Um, but may actually wind up helping the injured victim. Uh in when all is said and done. So let's get into um, WWE Roadblock and we'll get into some Raw and sort of look at, at where we're going um, once again as we head towards WrestleMania 32. Now, you know, I, I had some big problems heading into WWE Roadblock because of where the WWE had lined up um, Triple H and Dean Ambrose, I thought, in sort of sidelining Roman Reigns, while at first, on paper, seemed like an excellent idea. Uh, I think, ultimately, again, probably backfired on them because of the fact that you've taken this divided superstar, the guy who isn't completely over one way or the other. He's booed, he's cheered, he's a little bit of both, but he's not really an overwhelming babyface that the WWE audience has rallied behind. And in sidelining him, you've allowed Dean Ambrose sort of a white-hot, very authentic um, character that the fans have really responded to and allowed him to sort of slide into Roman Reigns' spot temporarily while they sort of mitigate the Roman Reigns' damage as they head into WrestleMania. But also, in doing that, what they have done is they have set Roman Reigns up for failure. Because when he inevitably returns, fans are going to see a situation where he is once again supplanting Dean Ambrose. Whether it's intentionally or subliminally, that's what's happening. The fans look at that and they say, oh, look, our guy is being pushed out again. Let's once again rage against the Roman Reigns machine because that's not the guy we want. We want this other thing. And between WWE Roadblock and the night after at Monday Night Raw, once again, it was clearly on display the very large issues the WWE has created for themselves in trying to book Roman Reigns 
as a babyface heading towards WrestleMania. Now I said I was going to focus on Roadblock, but I'm going to I'm going to sort of span both shows here to once again illustrate where the WWE has gone wrong with Roman Reigns. They think they're doing the right thing, but what they're really doing is sending messages to the fans as to exactly why they should be booing this guy. Exactly why. So let's start with Roadblock, though. Let, let's start here where you have the main event is the World Heavyweight Championship on the line with Triple H having accepted the challenge of the lunatic fringe Dean Ambrose for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. The title is on the line, and Dean Ambrose, even with a match lined up against Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 32, is going to step out of turn and commit to chasing after the title. Why? Because they need a main event to fill in while they once again sideline Roman Reigns and sort of allow the booze to die down heading towards WrestleMania. But in doing so, what you do is you take once again a white hot baby face and stick him in the place of Roman Reigns. And Dean Ambrose right now, whether you like it or not, especially if you're the WWE, is incredibly over. The fans respond to this guy. They see him as slightly off, a little bit strange, but he's a fighter. That is the one thing that you can look at Dean Ambrose and say this is why people respond to him. This guy is a fighter. He gets his ass kicked. He gets right back up. He fights. He scraps. He claws for everything that he gets. That's the thing about Dean Ambrose that they don't get, which is also the same thing about Roman Reigns that they don't get. Dean Ambrose doesn't feel as if he's been given or handed anything. Dean Ambrose feels like someone who, at least through the perception of what he does in the ring, has had to overcome the obstacles to get where he's at. I mean, look, he's a good-looking guy, but he's not Roman Reigns pretty. He's athletic enough, but he doesn't look like he's chiseled out of granite. He is a guy who comes to the ring in jeans and a wife beater slash tank top ready to go ready to fight ready to do whatever it is whether it's rake the eyes bite a forehead headbutt somebody throw an awkward elbow off the top rope there's a number of things that he is willing to do in order to get to where he is and as a result, the fans respond to that. So you stick him in a match against Triple H, who you're trying to get some sort of heel heat on as you head towards WrestleMania, because you don't want to go into WrestleMania 32 with Triple H being booed. I mean, being cheered by the smart fan base and Roman Reigns being booed. It doesn't cr come across well on television. The group thing starts to set in where people look at this and they go, uh, I don't know then about this Roman Reigns guy. So you're sort of pissing in the wind if you're the WWE. So once again, they stick a baby face against Triple H in the hopes that here we can get some heat on him. 
And maybe, even if they don't want to cheer Roman Reigns because they like him, maybe they'll cheer Roman Reigns because they hate Triple H that much. That's the idea. On paper, you can look at that and say, that kind of makes sense. But once again, when you look at the way that this whole thing has been laid out, they have been one step off at every turn with what they should have been doing to help Roman Reigns get over as a babyface. Once again, let me get into Roadblock and we'll get into Raw the next night because these are two perfectly glaring examples of how the WWE's missteps, how just being slightly off Can, has contributed to where Roman Reigns is at right now. So Dean Ambrose and Triple H have a very good match. Good back and forth. Dean Ambrose is pushing Triple H to the brink. All about respect and being underestimated by the champion. Being written off. And that's something that the fans can identify with. A guy who's not getting the due he deserves. They look at that and they say, I get that. I can identify with that. Maybe I see that in my own life. I think I'm good at things and I don't get the talent. I don't get the credit for my talent that I believe I deserve. And as a result, that's why Dean Ambrose can be such a compelling character for them. So Ambrose is fighting for respect to prove that he belongs and pushes Triple H to the brink. Now, you have this real bullshit false pin towards the end where it looks like Ambrose has won the match. But because his foot is slightly underneath the ropes, the referee waves it off even though he's counted three. Now that's supposed to somewhat get heat on Triple H for now escaping through sort of bullshit means with the title here. <clears throat> but ultimately, it doesn't really fall on him. It falls on the referee because he counted three and then immediately waves it off. It's just not a, not a good transition. And then it's not explained very well, especially if you're live. So as a result, now you have a crowd that's vehemently and adamantly against sort of this swerve. that basically then doesn't play well on television. And the crowd is into now Dean Ambrose's chase. They feel like he's screwed. And once again, Ambrose is laying it all out on the line. And Triple H emerges victorious. Hits the pedigree, takes out Dean Ambrose, gets a three count. And then that's sort of it. Now, knowing that WrestleMania 32 is following after Roadblock and that we're really in the home stretch following Roadblock, this could have been a prime opportunity for Roman Reigns to come in on his white horse in his shining armor. And been the knight, the babyface knight, that the WWE Universe might respond to. Maybe Triple H once again takes out frustrations on Dean Ambrose. For pushing him harder than he thought. Or for testing him too much. This close to WrestleMania. And from there, you can have Roman Reigns come down and provide the save on the guy people like. And now, Roman Reigns is babyfaced by association. He's done something good. He's done something heroic. In order to be declared a hero. But that doesn't happen on Roadblock. Triple H beats Dean Ambrose, they count three, and we go home. That's it. The credits roll and we're out. 
a prime missed opportunity for Roman Reigns to be in a good spot. So now what happens? The next night on Raw, could this be the return of Roman Reigns? Could this be a chance for him to do something heroic? So let's break it down. So Triple H in the middle of the show, after Dean Ambrose has a confrontation with Brock Lesnar, it doesn't really sort of go anywhere, just teases the lengths once again that Ambrose will go to with Brock Lesnar by first introducing a crowbar and then later him being gifted a barbed wire baseball bat by Mick Foley. Not really touching on the night before. So now we're in full-blown Roman Reigns mode. So Triple H comes out in the middle of the show and cuts the lengthiest promo. I mean, this is one of those stereotypical Triple H is droning on for 15 minutes, way too long segments. And in the middle, he is interrupted by Dolph Ziggler. Now, weeks ago, I said and I, that Dolph Ziggler would be the perfect guy to line up against Triple H because of how over he is as a babyface in order to get severe heat on Triple H heading towards WrestleMania. Go back, check the tapes. Well, at first I said, maybe Dean Ambrose, and then I saw how they were setting up. I said, ah, Dolph Ziggler, probably the better guy. Because while they're skinning the game with the fans and Dolph Ziggler, they also understand that Dolph Ziggler, yeah, probably not on the main event level. So they don't feel that he's being cheated. They just look at a guy that they like sort of being shafted in the overall landscape of the WWE. So Dolph Ziggler comes out and interrupts and says exactly that. That as talented as he is, he's been screwed by the system. That he is where he is on the card because of the way that the WWE has been laid out. The way that the hierarchy currently ranks. And he speaks very meta with the, with the way that the wrestling fanboys slash IWC perceive Dolph Ziggler and how he's been quote-unquote buried or not pushed to his fullest potential or taken advantage of what Dolph Ziggler is capable of doing as an in-ring hand. And he speaks to that. He's willing to rage against the machine. He's willing to speak up and against Stephanie McMahon and Triple H and put it out there that even as the guy who single-handedly defeated them at the Survivor Series two years ago and put them out of power, whatever was the result of that never really came to pass. Never really got the rub or the benefit of that. It was kind of just put right back where he was prior and I'll give credit to WWE creative for sort of tapping into this political idea right now of people who are angry with the system people who are angry with the quote unquote elites people who see themselves in a position where they feel helpless even though they have so much to offer to the world. Whether it's in their their friendships, whether it's in their family, whether it's in their workplace, they're not living up to their potential. And it's not their own fault. They're doing whatever it is that they can to create their own opportunities. It's the fault of others who look at them and just keep on walking who don't want to give up their own real estate to bring somebody else up who would rather give it maybe to their friends or somebody they know there's real anger there 
that exists right now. You just look at the 2016 election. You can see the anger that exists there that the WWE is now trying to tap into by sort of giving a pat on the back to those who aren't quote-unquote insiders, who are still on the outside, even though they may have been here, who aren't looked at as, you know, part of the upper echelon or part of the crew or who don't play the politics well. So I thought the Ziggler interruption was really good. And what we get is a match between Triple H and Dolph Ziggler on Monday Night Raw punctuated by a Stephanie McMahon slap to Ziggler's face where this is Dolph Ziggler's chance to get onto WrestleMania that if he wins this match he'll be able to pick whatever match he wants at WrestleMania outside of the WWE World Heavyweight Championship and they'll give it to him And he puts truth to power by saying, you know, this is going to be one of those situations where I get screwed, where you're going to stack the deck, where you're going to make sure you don't lose. And people, once again, identify with that. So the match is set. Triple H versus Dolph Ziggler. And they look, it's a really good match. Triple H goes back-to-back nights and puts out really good performances here. And Dolph Ziggler is always good in these situations. One, he sells like crazy. Everything that Triple H does, Ziggler is able to make a look like a million bucks. Because he sells well. He sells its impact. He sells its effect. He sells how much he is hurt by it. And he sells the underdog of Dolph Ziggler. That this is going to be an uphill climb. That this is going to be a tough feat for him to accomplish. That this is... A situation... Where for him to maybe taste success, he's going to need that extra gear. That extra something. He's going to need the fans to rally behind him. And they do. As they always do. It is always a fascinating situation to me. I brought this up I think a couple of shows back. To see how good Dolph Ziggler is because Dolph Ziggler will lure you in. Even though the build up to the match in the weeks and the months leading up to it have given you no reason at all to believe that Dolph Ziggler will emerge victorious. But that's how good Ziggler is. He gives you the taste. He gives you a taste of uh, what if... He gets you to believe only for them to pull the rug out from under you and make you feel like shit. And they do it here again. Triple H dominating Dolph Ziggler. Getting you to invest In Dolph Ziggler's comeback. Which of course he gets. Beautiful match structure. Really sound story told here. This is when wrestling is at its best. Telling stories like this match. But once again, another failed opportunity for them to benefit Roman Reigns.
Why? Because Triple H wins the match. With a pedigree. Cleanly. And that's it. Dolph Ziggler's chances of going on and having a match at WrestleMania are eliminated by Triple H's victory. And that's it. We move on from there. And then the truly bizarre happens. Is that after Dolph Ziggler has already lost... Roman Reigns surfaces after. His music hits. And he comes out. And he goes after Triple H. And he brutally beats Triple H. He busts him open on the side of the head. He smashes his face repeatedly into the commentator table. He takes him into the backstage area. And he beats him with a TV. And while all of this is happening, while he's giving Triple H some sort of comeuppance for breaking his face weeks ago, Roman Reigns still gets booed. Why? Because once again, they haven't put Roman Reigns in a position to do anything heroic. For the fans to get behind. Being violent and getting retribution on Triple H? Okay, maybe. But the timing of it is all wrong. Because to do it following the loss of a beloved babyface. Who sees no benefit from Roman Reigns' return. How does that help your guy? Once again... Two nights in a row where baby faces were in position that had Roman Reigns come out and helped them, he would have been cheered for his actions. Because they wouldn't have been selfish. They would have been selfless. They would have been him doing something for the greater good. Be it another WWE superstar, or for the universe as a whole, or what's best for business, or however it is that you want to spell it out. Roman Reigns helping Dean Ambrose out of a tight situation the night before? That would have been great! Didn't happen. Roman Reigns coming back on Monday Night Raw and sticking it to the authority? By helping Dolph Ziggler get one over on him? That would have been great. But to show up immediately following that? How does that help Roman Reigns? How does that help Roman Reigns get over with the people who are booing him when he's acting kind of like a dick? I'm just saying. Put somebody else before yourself and maybe the fans would respond to that. Maybe the fans would look at that and say, Oh man, look at that guy. He's helping out other people in need. Helping out other good dudes. Let's cheer for him because he's also good. It's not rocket scientist. It's not rocket science either. It's pretty plain and simple. You want to present this guy as a hero? Have him do heroic things. And you had two opportunities on two successive nights to do that, and you failed at that. You failed to even just connect those very simple dots. 
help Dean Ambrose or help Dolph Ziggler or help them both. Don't just come out on your own by yourself and say, well, this is this is how it's going to work. Have the guy do something that benefits others and not just himself. Because then to look at this and say, well, I don't understand why he's getting booed. I can tell you why he's not getting, why he's getting booed, why he's not getting cheered. Assist those who are also getting cheered. Use that as a rub for yourself. Instead of being the loner who just does things by himself. Because then afterwards, when he's beating the shit out of Triple H, the Usos come out to stop him. Mark Henry shows up to stop him. Jack Swagger shows up to stop him. Even before Dean Ambrose is always helping this guy. And this guy helps no one. It's not that hard. And yet they make it so difficult. And you head towards WrestleMania with a main event that's split because you have a babyface challenging for the title or to get revenge that the people aren't really behind. They're not behind his revenge. They're not behind his chase for the title. And this is why. Because he hasn't done anything for people to look at and say, this is why I should root for him. Yeah, he's got a cool look. And a couple of cool moves. But if you want to make your hero matter, you have to make him heroic. Even if that means cheating. As long as he's helping other heroes, that makes him heroic. He may be skewing from his moral compass, but he's doing it to do the right thing. He's not breaking the rules, he's bending the rules. You know, it's amazing how much time we spend on these podcasts talking about how badly... They have mishandled Roman Reigns. Because you could look at it and say, Yeah, that's it! Billy, you nailed it! And I have! Because it's not that hard! Watch tons of wrestling in my life! You, you pull... What's good and what's bad from it? And you'll learn. Nobody's learning here. They're trying to reinvent the wheel. With Roman Reigns, they're trying to say, let's just do something different with him and see if it works. And then when it doesn't, they go, ah, shit. I don't know why that didn't work. Because you left the path and you paved for yourself. It's as if they were walking down the street and a sign existed that said Roman Reigns over with an arrow in that direction, straight ahead. And they said to themselves, fuck it, let's just take a right. And then when they got lost or ended up in BFE, they looked around at each other and said, I don't know how we got here. It's not that hard. Quit making it so goddamn hard. I don't know if you can fix it now. 
I mean, I guess you can. You can always fix it. But you gotta commit to it. And make it right. Because the only way you're gonna save this WrestleMania 32 main event. And for trying to get a hundred something thousand people in there, I look at the way that WrestleMania is being laid out and I wonder to myself how that's even gonna happen. Because I look at the card, I look at the matches, I look at the build, and I say, why are they doing this? I mean, let's pivot to the Undertaker situation. Where ever since Shane McMahon surprisingly arrived on the scene to challenge for control of the WWE, particularly Monday Night Raw, it's all been downhill. There should have been laser focus on that being the stakes. And then we stick him into a Hell in the Cell match with The Undertaker, which people don't know how to feel with because they both, they like Shane McMahon, but they also like The Undertaker. We have this weird Vince McMahon promos where he's getting hard on about disowning his son. Even this week, once again, Vince comes out and, and ends the show with this segment where once again he's talking about how The Undertaker is his weapon of destruction. And Shane comes out and cuts eh, not really a, a good promo about how he's going to defeat The Undertaker, but really the only thing that's introduced there that's any sort of intriguing is this idea of who controls The Undertaker. Is The Undertaker his own independent entity who just does whatever the hell he wants because he's The Undertaker? Or is The Undertaker somehow beholden to Vince McMahon after 25 years? That's an interesting idea. An interesting wrinkle. Some doubt to creep into the story. But overall, I get the sense that there's a lot of indifference towards how this story is being built. Towards the stakes of what it matters here. And those are the two biggest matches on the card. We got work to do, fellas. Work to do. Hard work to do. As you get things ready for WrestleMania. And look, I'm rooting for you. Root for you every year. Every year I go to WrestleMania and every year I go, eh, I don't know. And then they put out something pretty amazing. Surprisingly amazing, actually. But in these situations, going in, I, I'm i not sure. Because what they've done leading up to the night of hasn't been too on point. Get on point. Get your shit together. Because right now it's it's all over the place. And it shows. Now I will say, I will give credit. I will give credit to Monday Night Raw for the opening segment. Because it wasn't a main event promo. A lengthy 15 to 20 minute promo. We got a little bit of a promo first. From the New Day. But then we got a New Day versus League of Nations tag match. Which I'm not crazy about because the League of Nations doesn't do shit for me. And this is also sort of the first time they've really acknowledged the Freebird rules. As far as the three man New Day team and who can defend the titles. But you also have the New Day attacking. Or the New Day being attacked four on three and being laid out. Now, the one thing I would say to that is, why is there no babyface coming in to save the New Day? And I guess it's also because the New Day is sort of a tweener. They've been a heelish for a while. Now they're starting to skew babyface because the fans have embraced them. But, at the same time, saving the New Day and also getting beaten down by the League of Nations would do good to getting somebody over. Once again, they have a roster right now that's not very over. And they need to get them there.
but this is the first time one of the very first time actually probably the first time i've seen the league of nations even get booed get any sort of reaction to anything that they do Number one, it's nice to have a different opening segment. And number two, it's nice to finally have this group get some sort of heat on themselves. To be put in a position where they are beating down somebody that the fans like and reaping the benefits of it. I know I've said in past weeks that I've kind of gotten a little bit sick of the new day i felt like they're just being trotted out there as sort of this thing that works and as a result they're going to run it into the ground but this is one of those situations where i looked at the new day and i said all right well now they're doing something interesting here now they're doing something that means something so credit to that Maybe there finally is something there to be done with the League of Nations. Maybe if you do book them as a cohesive heel unit, they could be a cohesive heel unit and not feel like four guys thrown together because you had nothing else for them to do. So as much as I have said that they should just trash the whole League of Nations idea, this is the first time I've looked at it and said, ah, maybe... Maybe there's something here. Maybe they can turn this thing around. I hope they continue on that path. I hope they continue to allow them to get heat on the New Day. Because then when the New Day is able to overcome and triumph on the League of Nations, that will make it that much more sweet. And everyone will come out looking all right. See, not rocket science. There's one other segment I wanted to point out on Raw, and then I'll go back to the overall impressions of uh, Roadblock, and that is there was a match between Sami Zayn and The Miz. Now, Sami Zayn also uh, had a match on Roadblock versus Stardust. Now, uh, with The Miz, they've been trying to build something. It looks like they're going to try and do something, you know, one of those big smash fests for the Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania. But the thing about... Sami Zayn on Monday Night Raw or even at Roadblock is that there are still a great number of people that don't know who Sami Zayn is. Now, on Roadblock, I found it incredibly frustrating that Michael Cole was treating the universe like it was stupid, basically spelling everything out for them. The origin of the Olay chants, just sort of, you know, uh, uh, making... Um, reference to one of uh, Sami Zayn's old personas, quote unquote. Uh, and, and spelling things out for them in such an obvious spoon-feeding way, which I wasn't a fan of. But at the same time, the WWE Universe as a whole don't know who Sami Zayn is. People who watch NXT regularly, those fans know who Sami Zayn is. But if you're the casual WWE fan who you just watch Monday Night Raw, maybe you catch a minute or two of SmackDown, but that's about it. You don't know who Sami Zayn is. And Sami Zayn showing up in the Royal Rumble was a cool moment. And a live audience in Orlando went and popped hard for it. But if you were watching it at home and you weren't familiar with Sami Zayn, you'd be like, uh, I don't understand what the big deal is. Who is that guy? Same thing with now Sami Zayn showing up regularly on Raw. Last week he comes out and he attacks Kevin Owens. But once again, there's no context for that. Even now, Michael Cole, you know, makes reference to past issues that he's had with Kevin Owens, but they don't show it. Show. Don't tell. You have NXT footage at your disposal. Show it. Show Sami Zayn's feud with Kevin Owens. Give people an understanding of their backstory and why they hate e each other so much. And instead of trying to hit the ground running that people are already caught up, show them. Put together a package. Do it for other people, but show them why Sami Zayn is a big deal. Show why Sami Zayn confronting Kevin Owens is a big deal. Get into the meat and potatoes there of what has happened so that people can say, Oh, I understand now. That makes sense. On top of that, if this is Sami Zayn's like second week on the main roster, don't interrupt his matches. 
or his entrance with commercials or flashbacks to what happened last Monday. Give him the whole thing. So that if you're there, you get into it. And if you're watching on TV, you get a feeling for who he is. Or as they, the WWE so easily described on the Breaking Ground series, give people a visual to want to be, to want to copy, to want to mimic. Because if you're not going to give vignettes that this guy is coming, then at least build up importance for why they're there. Those are my comments on Sami Zayn. I love Sami Zayn. I do. A great deal. But you got to put them in a position to once again succeed. Or else they're going to look at it. They're going to see that the fans are indifferent. They're going to throw their hands up and say, See, another NXT guy didn't work. Well, when you don't give them a chance to work. When you sort of tie their hands behind their back as soon as they come up. And they throw things in passionate plea. Then, yeah, they're not going to work. One other note out of Monday Night Raw, and then I'll get into Roadblock, and that is that uh, Adrian Neville was injured. Appears he may have suffered uh, fractures in his lower leg. He will be out at WrestleMania and beyond. The timetable yet uh, is unknown because no one knows this, quite the severity of what has taken place. But as a fan of Neville, it is sort of upsetting for him to sort of go down like that. Um, maybe this benefits Neville. You know, the fans have gotten their taste of him on the main roster. They know who he is. And as a result, they're excited. Excited for him to return down the line when he comes back. Because as of late, he's just sort of been kept off the TV and is sort of been in no man's land. You know, he's a guy, they bring him in, they allow him to do with high spots, but beyond that, he then sort of just goes back away. I'd like for Adrian Neville to be a regular part of the main roster, and right now, I don't know that it's the right time to capitalize on his skills. So maybe the injury, as unfortunate as it is, the silver lining is maybe it allows him, much like Seth Rollins, at a time where he was sort of viewed in a way to not be the strongest champion the WWE could have. Here, maybe you have a chance for Neville to go away, and when he comes back, people remember him, but they remember all the bad things that have been happening as of late with him on the main roster. They look at it and they go, I remember what that guy could do, and now I'm excited that he's here. And you give him a meaningful place to re-enter, and now you got a, a next level fresh Neville. So I hope his recovery is swift. Hope he gets healthy. Unfortunate, though, that that happened. Now, let's get over to the overall picture of WWE Roadblock. Now, we've been sort of skirting around for great portions of the show. The show overall, pretty underwhelming. Pretty underwhelming. I mean, it's a house show. It's a house show in Toronto that they didn't decide. Let's sort of play up for the WWE Network in between Fastlane and WrestleMania. And, you know, we'll give people a reason to watch. But you look at the matches that were laid out on the card. And, look, if you were to go to the live event, if you were to go to a house show, if you were to have gone in Toronto to this show on your Saturday night and watched it, you might have been fine. You might have looked at it and just been like, I just feel like watching some wrestling. The problem is the perception that comes from this, which is that it's televised. And if it's televised, the WWE tries to make it that it means something. You look at it and you say, yeah, this is important. But I don't know that it is. You know, the New Day versus the League of Nations, which sort of got sloppy towards the end. 
It was alright. I mean, at least they have two sort of even sides. But then you have Chris Jericho versus Jack Swagger. Where the hell's Jack Swagger been? Once again, they pull Jack Swagger out, they dust him off every once in a while. You have a really great Jericho heel promo on the home can of audience. But you also have a, a situation where... Jack Swagger's world title is recalled, which once again just reminds us of how far Jack Swagger has fallen to be in the position that he's at right now. It also calls into question the timing of the Chris Jericho turn on AJ Styles, because if Chris Jericho is going to go to Canada and be on TV where he's going to get a hometown reaction, how does that help him? How does that help get him and, and AJ Styles over in a feud with Chris Jericho as the heel? Also, might I add, uh, JBL might be one of the most annoying announcers ever. Period. Just just top to bottom. Raw, road, black, pay-per-views, doesn't matter. Can't take it. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm really... I can't, I, I just can't anymore. I used to try, now he speaks and my ears just want to like close. They're just like, I can't listen to this bullshit anymore. You know, so you have something like that. You have Sami Zayn versus Stardust, which the crowd's just not feeling because once again, Stardust, where's he been? And they're getting time to work. It's like a two and a half hour show. So they're getting time to work. But when it's put on TV, you want there to be something to invest in. Something to feel like it's consistent with the rest of television. And it just didn't. Charlotte versus Natalia for the Divas title just didn't work. It's really weak finish. Natalia's no-selling the figure eight. Kicks out of natural selection. How does that help Charlotte become a monster champion on the path to WrestleMania? Doesn't. Brock Lesnar versus Bray Wyatt doesn't really happen. Bray Wyatt is, I believe, injured, so he's sort of got he's sort of, you know, being put out there but protected. So you get a Brock Lesnar squash over Luke Harper, which feels like a bait and switch. You're watching it on TV, you feel gypped considering that the way that they started to promote Lesnar and Wyatt. So you have a number of matches here on the card that just they don't do anything. You look at him and you go, yeah, if I was there, it would have been all right. But to sit on my couch and watch it at home, uh, this isn't all that exciting. The one match, though, that I will say stands out from the entire card is Enzo and Big Cass versus The Revival for the NXT Tag Team Champion. Chip. There's a feud there. There's a hatred there. There's something there that if you were to watch NXT, you can take stock of. You can say, yeah, this... I get this, why this match is happening. Now look, I'll say this too. Big Cass has been hitting that performance center because the dude's getting huge. Way bigger than he was. He was just kind of a tall dude. Now he's tall and like, he's getting pretty stacked. Which is going to help him when they eventually transition up to the main roster. But I thought overall just a fantastic tag match. Revival gets it. Enzo and Big Cass are greatly improved as a tag team. I mean, really hitting another gear. Really good. So a fantastic match that I found was hurt by the commentating. Because you have Byron Saxon's there, who's familiar with NXT. But once again, you have Michael Cole and JBL, who... You know... It's not their main focus. Their main focus is the main roster. Maybe long for Rich Brennan and Corey Graves. I'll even take Tom Phillips and Corey Graves. Either of them. It's obvious when you have a commentating team calling a match who's not all that familiar with the talent in the match or the storyline of the match. 
personal vendettas, feuds, whatever, heading into the match. And maybe, maybe miss the NXT team calling it. I think the match would have been better served. As good as it was in the ring, I think just the overall package was sort of lacking because of the commentators. So overall, you look at WWE Roadblock, and it just, it's just kind of there. I thought Beast in the East was much more exciting. It has a much more unique presentation to it. Here, it just... It felt like, you know, something wedged into... The schedule between Fastlane and WrestleMania. If you were to take this card and put it another point in the year, another time, maybe it would have come across better. But as it stood here, at this time, when all the focus should be on WrestleMania, nah. Nah. Just not, just not happen. And I also want to give some depth uh, to Sami Zayn and Samoa Joe. I know I, you know, not critical of Sami Zayn, just critical of the way that Sami Zayn has been presented as uh, as he's moved to the main roster. But I wanted to give some depth to the best two out of three falls match on NXT that I managed to catch up with between Sami Zayn and Samoa Joe. Once again, fantastic, fantastic work between these two dudes. I mean, just they know how to work against each other. Really good chemistry. It was even fine watching it in front of the Full Sail audience. Primarily because I was really into what they were what they were doing. So a lot of credit to them. Uh, I got an NXT t- topic that uh, I'm going to table for another show. I got to maybe, uh, we're going to table it. it it's, it's, not, it's not timely. It doesn't need to be done right away. But I'm going to table it. Had it on the agenda for today, but I'm going to table it until I can get have some more time to get into it uh, in depth. Don't want to rush it. Overall, though, wanted to give my impressions of Roadblock and Monday Night Raw uh, as we head towards WrestleMania. Just, I thought, two... Uh, two fairly weak shows, a couple of high spots being uh, League of Nations versus New Day. Um, you know, Dolph Ziggler, I'm really curious to see what's happening with him because it feels like post WrestleMania, there's a spot here for him to do something fantastic. There's a spot here for him to capitalize and maybe, maybe try to elevate Dolph Ziggler up to that next level that people have been hoping that he would hit in recent years. I think there's something interesting there. End Zone Big Cas versus the Revival at Roadblock I liked. But overall, that's sort of a, a weak week of wrestling. At least in the WWE universe. And once again, just more missteps with Roman Reigns. That, look, you gotta fix these things. You really do. Now, I don't know if anybody from the WWE listens to this show. I don't know. From the way that they have employed certain ideas after they've been introduced on the show, it is quite possible. And I'll be waiting for your call and your check at some point in the future. But if you are out there and you are listening to this show, please heed this advice. If you want Roman Reigns to get over as a heroic, white-hot babyface. You need to have him do something heroic and selfless for other hot babyfaces. That's my advice. Please take it. Your WrestleMania may depend on it. And that's it for this particular show. So I want to thank you guys for making it all the way to the end. I want to thank you guys for downloading, streaming, tuning in, listening. I greatly appreciate the support. Please make sure that you go ahead and you follow us on social media. Okay? 
hit up the Just the Worst podcast Twitter handle. It's the official one at JTW Podcast. Every time we get a new show up and running, we'll post it it's there and notify you as long as you follow us on Twitter. Over um, on Twitter as well, make sure you follow the official pod, the official handle of our home mothership. This is infamous. You can do that at Tis Infamous, T I S Infamous. And uh, right now, the site is un- undergoing some reconstruction. We're doing some heavy building with hammer and nails. Once everything is up and running once again, we will notify you there first. So hit that up at Tis Infamous. And make sure you follow me on Twitter as well at infamous kid two d's at the end for all of my ramblings rantings and musings that's where you want to go over on facebook work through those algorithms and like all of our pages though facebook.com slash just the worst podcast facebook.com slash tis infamous and facebook.com slash billy the kid podcast can be found at soundcloud right now so soundcloud.com slash just the worst podcast also, if you have a mobile device, Apple, Android, however it is that you got it, you make sure that you download the app, okay? Get the app. SoundCloud app. You subscribe to all of our podcasts, and whether it's on your phone or your tablet, you will get every episode of every show right there for you to listen to whenever you want. The drop of a hat, uh, on the dime, whatever, instantly, you'll get them all. So the SoundCloud app or soundcloud.com slash just the worst podcast. That's how you listen or stream all the shows right now. You can find all my work regularly at joeblow.com. This is infamous, especially our YouTube channel. And right here at just the worst podcast. This has been just the worst podcast. No, correction. This has been just the worst wrestling podcast. Episode number 27. I have been your host, Billy Donnelly. You make sure you hit those ropes hard and kick out before the count of three. Because that's the rules. That's the way the game is played. So take care of that. You take care of yourself. Have yourself a pleasant, immediate future. For now, I'm out. I'll be back next week. Peace. Just the Worst Wrestling Podcast, episode number 27, has been a presentation of Just the Worst Podcast Media.